Revelation chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 7. Well, we finally have a good church. We've talked about <coughs> some very troubled churches. And uh, I, I'm glad today we get to look at a good church. The church at Philadelphia. We surely everybody knows Philadelphia means brotherly love. Anybody did not know that? Raise your hand. Nobody's going to admit it. Everybody knew that Philadelphia means brotherly love. Yes, it does. And this is where that came from. So we'll look at this church today. We'll learn some lessons. And then I, uh, after we go through this, I have three passages of Scripture in the New Testament to help us and to encourage us. Now, the uh, those who make these seven churches uh, a uh, specific time frame in the history of the church for the last 2,000 years, I like it. They don't know what to do with this church. They don't know what to do with this church. The reality is uh, this church fits in any time period. The Lord said he'll always have two churches. The Lord said he'll always have Christians. He'll always have preachers. He'll always have a witness. Uh, the Holy Ghost will be in every city. So Philadelphia works in any period. Uh, the particular study I'm using uh, says uh, it's a picture of the true church and the professing church. Well, yeah, but it actually fit, fits any church period. So uh, I want us to look at this church. It was a good church. It was a loving church. And uh, Philadelphia was, first of all, a city uh, given to a lot of earthquakes. It, it had an earthquake in A.D. 17 uh, that almost completely destroyed the city, uh, but they did end up rebuilding it. The, um, the city was built by an emperor by the name of Tiberius, uh, and it was originally called Neo Caesarea. But it's the city that we know, or did know, as Philadelphia. The, um, my sense of humor kind of kicked in. The predominant industry of Philadelphia was, uh, it, it had the notable wine industry. And I couldn't help but wonder if that had anything to do with why it's also called the Loving Church. Just kidding, folks, that was a joke. Some of y'all were too sleepy to catch that. <coughs> verse number seven. And by the way, have you noticed that the first verse of every church is a description of the Lord Jesus Christ? The, the last verse, the second to the last verse of each church is a reward for being faithful, and then the application to every church. He that has an ear, let him hear. So let's look at this church. And the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. These things say, he that is holy, holy, uh, pure, holy, perfect, holy, described as bright light, light that cannot be seen. Just like when we get to the end of Revelation, the gold of the street, by the way, it's not streets of gold, the song books, have it wrong, there's only one street of gold. And that gold is so pure, it's clear. How about that? So, holy uh, is the purity, the ineffable brightness and majesty of God. There are seven what I call theophanies in the Bible. A theophany is a physical manifestation of some kind of deity. Each time that happened, the people fainted dead away. Because as people, we cannot behold such brightness of beauty and luster. 
it just it's just more than human beings can bear. Now the after holy is he that is true. Uh, the two go together. If he's not holy, he can't be true. If he's holy, he is true. Proverbs 35, every word of God is pure. Then he that hath the key of David, okay? Um, my Sunday school class this morning, the uh, genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, from Joseph and Mary back to David because he had come out of the kingly line a king, uh, a king in those days was an absolute monarch. His word was law. At his word, people lived. At his word, people died. At his word, there was peace. At his word, there was war. This, under David the king, in the Old Testament, is as close as this planet has ever seen a government closest to that which is going to be by the Lord Jesus Christ. During the millennium and then into all eternity, his rule will be absolute sovereign period. The truth of the matter is, democracy is not God's pattern of a government. Benign dictatorship is God's idea of a government. If you can find a good dictator, that's good. But the problem is, even if you put one in that's good, it's not long because he's a human being. The money and the power corrupts him. And I think probably the classic illustration in our lifetime, or before our lifetime, would be Hitler. Uh, he started out good, what put him in was good, what he did for a little bit was good. He liberated the German people from, uh, from uh, the indebtedness, just like America's in debt now. Uh, but then they began to laud him till they went to his head and he went nuts. And you know the rest of the story, of course. Someone has mockingly said the ideal government would be a good taker for two years and then you better kill him. Of course, you can't do that, of course. You all look at me like, huh? <coughs> By the way, you know what? A, uh, the way our government's going, you know what the first thing a uh, 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 dictator does when he takes over? Kills all the lawyers. For real. Don't look at me that way. For real. You know what the second thing a dictator does? Crushes the news media. Read a history book. You don't look at me like you're kidding. I'm not kidding. Okay. But never mind, George. Just go on. You're looking at you like a calf or a new gate. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write these things, say he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David. Absolute authority. What does a key do? Unlocks a door. What does a key do? Locks a door. So, he that openeth, no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Absolute rule. But it'll be a good rule. It'll be a godly rule. It'll be a perfect rule. It'll be a right rule. I know thy works. You know, he said that about every church. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. Only God can open a door of salvation to lost people. Only God can keep a door open for a church. I'm convinced God has done that for this church. Absolutely. Bedrock convinced God has done that for this church. Number three, only God can keep a door open of opportunity. And God has done that for this church. God has kept it open, and God has kept a door of opportunity open. Now, they're not coming in here a dozen at a time, but folks, we hardly have a Sunday morning without visitors. 
So that leads me to emphatically say, the Lord has given Washington Street an open door. Washington Street Baptist Church still has an open door. And, and we have a responsibility with that to do right. I know that works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it. Let the soothsayers say what they want to. God has kept this church. God is keeping this church. And God will continue to keep this church as long as we stay in His will. Would people like to see us go out of business? Sure. When I came here, to, to, when we began to consider to be a pastor, and I began to uh, consider it. Uh, there were people who said, oh, don't do it, it's too late, they're done. They're wrong. They were wrong. For thou hast a little strength. Is this church at this point what it was? I'm saying under Brother Johnson, when this, this, you had to get in here early to get a seat? No. It's not. I mean, that's just honest. It's not there. But that doesn't mean my business. Thou hast a little strength. This church has enough strength to go on. And by that, I mean, we've got enough money to keep the doors open. We've got enough people to keep the doors open. Uh, we've got enough workers to carry on the work. And there's enough of the Spirit of God on this church to keep going. Thou hast a little strength. Amen. And thank God for that. For thy full strength and has kept my word. This church still stands on the word of God. And by the way, we're not the only one. The big churches, many of them that have uh, uh, done whatever it takes to, uh, to, to get a big crowd and to build, build buildings, they get all the glory. But folks, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, there are a lot of churches all over America, just like this one who are holding to the Word of God. Thou hast kept my word and has not denied my name. We still believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that salvation is in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, that the Bible is the Holy Word of God and tells us uh, about us and tells us about the Lord God. And it tells us and we believe that Jesus Christ literally is coming back to this planet. We're not the only ones. There are a lot of them out there still. Just like that. But God keeps us. God keeps us individually. God keeps us as a church. Verse number 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say are Jews and are not, but do lie. Now, we do not have the Jewish people persecuting this Gentile church. And we don't see a lot of that in uh, America today. Uh, but uh, we do have uh, Satan's crowd, lost people, uh, who are really uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. We do need to be on the guard for them. And we do need to pray every day for the Lord to protect this church and to protect us all. Because if we're not on guard, Satan will slip somebody in here. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say the Jews are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. It's God that protects his church from enemies, from without, and within. And God loves his church. And you know, folks, God, the Lord God Almighty loves you individually. The Lord God Almighty loves this church corporately. And that's really important. That is really, really important. And, and when you know that, what does it matter what man says? What's important is the Lord does know us and he loves us. 
because thou hast kept the word of my patience. Now, there's an interesting definition of the word of God. The word of my patience. It takes patience to be a Christian. We look for the Lord to come. It's been 2,000 years now. It takes patience to put up with people who don't understand us or don't like us because we're Christians. It takes patience when people oppose the church to stay put. It takes patience. But the Word of God will give you that patience. Romans 15, 4. Whatsoever things were written, the fourth of them were written for our learning, that we through comfort and patience of the Scriptures might have hope. Why do you keep coming back every service? Because you think this is right. And it is. The word of my patience. And the Lord promised, I also will keep thee. We're still here because God's kept us. I said this morning, I'll say it again. We're not here because uh, our wonderful are strong and everything else is being done right. We're people. We make mistakes like everybody else. We sin like everybody else. No, we're still here because God keeps us. Because God keeps us. And I want you to notice something. I also will keep thee, not only now, but listen to this, from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That's the great tribulation. This is one of the predominant premier verses in the New Testament that we believe why we're pre-tribulation believers. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ will come back before the great tribulation to take his church out. True believers. That's what it says. We shall come upon all the world to keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. We're kept now and we will be kept in the future when God finds out the fa Father finally when the hour of reckoning against sin of this planet comes. And then we have this promise to hold it come quickly. Quickly means suddenly and without warning and also means uh, in an instant like the rapture snatched up. And so, while we're in this world, here's our job. Hold that fast, which thou hast. And, and, I, I, and, and in a day when churches are under so much social pressure to please the people, I think it's important for us to remember when we meet, sing, study the Word of God, preach, pray, fellowship, do what evangelism we can, then we have done and are doing what God expects a church to do. We cannot even begin to compete with other churches. We do not want to compete with other churches and their programs. We don't have the money and we don't have the manpower. So don't be intimidated by the programs of large ministries. Folks, when we meet and, and sing and pray and fellowship and study and evangelize, we have done and are doing what God expects our church to do. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. I don't want to get too much get into that because we'll do that later in Revelation, but there are rewards. We do not earn our salvation. That's a free gift of God. Even our service for the Lord will be rewarded. Him that overcometh. And Christians are overcomers. Him that overcometh. 
Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no mile. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Okay, what's the deal with the pillar and us being uh, 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 God write on his name, and uh, and uh, uh, the new name? Okay, let me, in the Roman period, and even today, when people accomplish great things, when they're gone, somewhere they'll put up a statue or a marble pillar and will write on that to commemorate their life. And it's a statement about their life. Uh, we're not going to literally be turned into a pillar of cement. God's not literally going to etch his name in our foreheads. The word here is the word memorial. Memorial. We in heaven will be, each and every one of us in heaven will be a living memorial to the faithfulness of God that kept us. Now let me read that again. It'll make sense. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. Now write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Let me say a word about uh, the city of God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. Uh, we'll get into this later in Revelation. There will come a time after the millennium. Of course, you know, in the millennium, the city of Jerusalem will be the, will be the capital city uh, of the world that the Lord Jesus Christ will reign from. And uh, But there's also the heavenly Jerusalem, the city four square, which we'll get into later. At some point in time after the millennium and the final judgment, earth and heaven, the city of Jerusalem on earth and the new Jerusalem will all merge together and that will begin eternity. Okay? That's all I will say about that now. And by the way, there's not a whole lot more to be said about that than what I just said. I'm convinced we're not told any more about that because we couldn't handle it. I mean, we can't handle the book of Revelation. Look at all the argument and the, the division and, and we're right and you're wrong and da da da. Can you imagine if God had spelled all of it out? Well, it'd be endless chaos. Not that I'm making mistakes. He told us enough to give us hope. And then he that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, let me say this. I think it's interesting. I think it's noteworthy. I think it's on purpose. I think it is significant that the church of Philadelphia is put where it is in the Bible just before the church of Laodicea. Because Laodicea, the one we're going to study next week, is the apostate church. And, and, and what this correlation and the way this is put together here simply means, yes, we are living in a time of great falling away. Yes, we're in the age of Laodicea. Look what we're doing. Uh, but folks in the middle of that, all over this planet, God still has his true churches. I want to be one of those, don't you? I want to be one of those true churches. Now, one more little thing. You've got your Bibles. Uh, Philadelphia, good church. Uh, they were loving people, and because they were loving people, it clicked. So let me give you three scripture verses to encourage us. First of all, let's go to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Matthew 22, 37 to 39. Remember the 
rich young ruler went to Jesus and said, what do I do to be perfect or to have eternal life? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. He said, I've kept them all. And then Jesus said this. Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. All the activity without the love of the Lord in our heart is unacceptable to God. The foundation under us is our love for the Lord. Christianity is a spiritual thing in here. This has to be right before any of this will be right. This has to be right before God will accept any of this. I want you to notice the second thing. I'd like for you to turn to John chapter number 13. John chapter number 13. <clears throat> Verse 34 and 35. John 13, verse 34 and 5. A new commandment. New, not in that it has never been said before. New in that, see this, the love commandment is all over the Old Testament. But here, it is brought from the Old Testament into the New Testament. New in that sense. A new commandment, I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. But they shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. You see what's important to the Lord? And folks, the most important thing in my life is to love you. It's not what I do, it's what I am. It's not all this out here, it's in here. And the same thing with y'all. Love each other. And I'm not talking about mushy sentimentality like uh, junior high ball of boy and girl, uh, first time they get good by each other. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a spiritual love, a love given by the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The Lord said, my test for good church is where people love each other. And then one more, and this would be 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We all know this is the love chapter. First Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I become a sound of brass or tinkling symbol. If I was the best preacher, and God knows I'm not, but if I was the best preacher, preaching man in the city of Stephenville, my heart wasn't filled with love for the Lord and for y'all. God says it's just noise. <coughs> Bless you. In verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so I could remove mountains and have not, no, have not love, it, I am nothing. If I knew this Bible forwards and backwards and knew it better than any, uh, any man on the face of this planet, and if I did not have spiritual faith, God said, I'm nothing. We have to be careful as believers to not fight or accept a double standard because the standard of what the world says is a good servant of the Lord and the standard of what God says is a good servant of the Lord are total opposites. And then number three, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and put in my body to be burned, and have love, not love, it profiteth me nothing. What's important to man is what we do. Give, 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 do, 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 go, 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 produce, 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 the general motor syndrome. What's important with God is what we are in here. Loving, Christ-like people trying to serve our fellow man and promote the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, then that is acceptable. And 
one day, and it's coming, we'll not be here anymore. The social order as we know it will not be here anymore. Verse 13, and now abide with faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. There will come a time when God will evaluate our work in our lives and anything done for Him that was not done out of a pure heart of love will be nothing. Wood, hay, stone. Folks, let's keep the fires of spiritual love growing in our hearts and growing in the church. And by the way, what draws people to us is love. People are hurting. People need the Lord. People need people that they can be drawn to. And when we exemplify the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is for God so loved the world, that will work for our good and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Well, next week we'll do loud be safe, and then we'll begin to move into the cross. Thank you for being here. God bless you. I hope you have a wonderful week. We can do anything. We can serve you in any way. Be sure. May the Lord bless you. Let's stand.